the idea that they paired elite deceleration and turn that into elite propulsive power. Like I would debate that with, you know, James Harden and Lucas right. specifically. I'd be like, I don't think so. I'm not sure there's anything more awe inspiring in sports than watching an athlete escape the pull of gravity to jump really, really high. While it may be cool to watch Steph Curry drain shot after shot, to see Tiger Woods rip a golf ball in his prime, or to watch Roger Federer glide effortlessly across a tennis court, all of these things take some level of sports appreciation and knowledge to really enjoy. But everyone, at some point in time in their life, has tried to jump high, even if most of us have tried to do so without a great deal of success. And that's why I wanted Daniel Martinez to be a guest on today's show. Between his time as a volleyball coach and working with Forstex, this guy knows the ins and outs of vertical jump training like few others in our industry. Daniel is currently in his fifth year as Trinity's head strength and conditioning coach and as coordinator of the Patrick Stumberg Sports Performance Center. He is also the coordinator of a conference on sports science and strength and conditioning, which brings top professionals in the field on campus to share best practices. Prior to his time at Trinity, Daniel was the U.S. consultant for Forstex, which works collaboratively with strength and conditioning and sports science departments internationally with teams ranging from the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, and the U.S. Olympic Committee. Now, if you're a regular to the show, welcome back. As always, love and appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Mike Robertson, and this is the Physical Preparation Podcast. In this show, we take deep dives into the art and science of coaching, cueing, program design, business, and personal development. Basically, anything to help you become a better trainer, coach, or rehab professional. Now, as a youngster coming up playing basketball and volleyball, I knew a bigger vertical jump would help my performance. But growing up in the 90s, well, let's just say that quality training information was few and far between, and you probably trained in a pair of jump soles far more than you'd like to admit. It wasn't until I got into college and started to work on really building my lower body strength and power that I saw my vertical jump skyrocket. So in today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the vertical jump. We're going to start by looking at the various phases of the jump and why each one is important. We'll look at high and low tech assessment strategies and help you figure out which is best based on where you're currently working and the budget you have available to you. We're gonna talk about the differences between fast jumpers and fast finishers. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about training interventions that will absolutely make a difference in your jump performance. So if you've ever been confused about evaluating or improving someone's vertical jump, this is going to be the episode for you. So we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll jump into this awesome episode with Daniel Martinez. It seems like every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if that sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get and who know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is going to take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes, how to create the culture environment and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results and the exact progressions regressions and coaching cues i use in the gym from squatting and deadlifting to pressing and pulling and everything in between of course there's a ton more that i cover but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about now here's the thing spots for the certification will only open twice per year for a limited time only to get on the insiders list just head over to CompleteCoachCertification.com. Again, CompleteCoachCertification.com, and then stay tuned for emails in the coming weeks. 
Thanks so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the complete coach certification when it launches. Daniel, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to finally get you on. Uh, For the listeners, it only took us three years to schedule this, mostly because uh, I asked Daniel to come on. He said yes, and then I forgot to respond to him. So three years later, here we are. But Daniel, man, thanks for coming on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Mike. Uh, Yeah, I've respected the work uh, from you and the network for a long time. So, of course, yes, I was happy when you originally asked and then perfectly happy to wait (laughs) for it to actually come to fruition. So, um, but yeah, I've been a strength condition coach. I've been in the field since, I mean, gosh, since 2001, you know, so right at the beginning of what I would consider like the performance training, what a performance enhancement shift to strength and conditioning where facilities like athletes performance and Mike Boyle were becoming prominent, right? A lot of us were in right behind that in our growth as coaches. And I, I, you know, it's funny to me, it's not an insignificant thing, you know, like that, uh, that we were developing at a time when there was this alternative viewpoint being explored. And then you recognize, especially with the internet, that a lot of us, you know, got a voice and then you get into these discussions, some of which you feel like, like, I don't even know how I'm in the same conversation with this individual or that individual. (laughs) Um, And then you just do the best with it that you can, you know, and I think that's how most of us get where we are. I love it, man. I love it. So, Talk to me and give me some background here. Like, what got you into the world of physical preparation originally? Like, what drew you to this space? Yeah, well, the number one thing is I was a failure as a college student athlete is <laughs> I, I was an athlete. My, You know, I really over identified with athlete and yeah. less so with student. And. I was told from a young age that like, hey, your mom and I, by my parents, of course, that uh, we're not going to, you know, we're helping your sister with college. We're not going to have the money to help you guys. So you can either join the military or get an athletic scholarship or something like that. Me being an athlete from when I was very young, just like naturally like loved sports and getting out there and training. I'd go practice by myself and all kinds of stuff my whole career. Uh, I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. But I never I honestly did. I never gave that much consideration to to the other side of that. Oh, you know, why do you go to college? You know, like, right. is, uh, what are you going to do with your life? Anything like that was an afterthought. So, of course, um, that didn't work for me. And then I left school and became a personal trainer and did that for a couple of years and then found my orientation, figured out that I liked what I was doing, but there was a specific track that I wanted to be on. So I went back to school and then uh, I guess things kind of took shape from there. I got involved in, in junior club volleyball pretty early on, as well as like, just, I would say club sports as a whole, like, yeah. and I think that disciplined me a ton as a coach to be really grateful of the opportunity to help anybody. And I think that honestly better prepared me for the time that I spent working in pro sport, because, you know, you just approach someone being like, I want to help. And yeah. if you're, if you bring that orientation, then it doesn't matter whether there's some 12 year old kid who has no idea who you are, or what your what the, the, depth and width of your experiences, or if there's somebody who's right on the, the, the top, uh, tier of, of what we're hoping to support development in. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a great point. And I think that's why the people that are in pro sports and the people that stick around for a really long time generally come at it from that approach, right? It's not about, Hey, I get to work with pro athletes. Like that's a cool side benefit, but it's really like, you have this you have this willingness to help anybody and everybody and you just happen to specialize in that particular demographic you know what i mean yeah no exactly and i mean there's there's realizations across my career that you you, you know you do you see that like yeah people they're like impressed right. that you work in this environment or that environment but they don't really care like what actually goes down <laughs> you know in in your day to day so if it doesn't really matter to you and it's not something you're really passionate about i don't think that you'll see it through if you're just chasing the you know whatever the brand or logo is on your chest i had an experience where pretty early on i was successful with a specific group of of youngsters in volleyball and uh, I think we put like 10 out of 12 kids in Division One volleyball, which for, wow. a, you know, uh, uh, for a club program that only had six teams in our first year, it was, you know, it was wow. it was I would consider that pretty successful in the early yeah, stages. Dude. And these were kids that I'd coached for a long time. So it was like, you know, I felt good about what we were doing. But I remember bringing up some of the stats and some of the development process and just talking people through the pathway and 
most of the parents could care less. Like they were just <laughs> like, and it, and it took me to, I've shared this thought before, but I had a conversation with a dad and he told me, he said, Daniel, he said, every volleyball parent is the same. They want the five best kids out on that court and their kid, you know? And it was just like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, that's such a great point. Yeah. yeah it, it needs to be fairness for everybody. I'm always for that. But if my kid's not out on the court, we got a problem. And so it's this like, you know, it's a self-centered orientation, but you know, that, that's what you have to appreciate, especially being a business owner is that, you could talk all these things, but if you can't connect and uh, help see them and help guide them through that same process, then you're not going to be successful. Yeah, I love it, man. Okay, so last but not least, this is partially for me because I always like to hear people's kind of background and their upbringing in sport, but also for the listeners because a lot of young coaches listen to the show and I like them to see that it's not, hey, I get a degree or I get a cert and then I have my dream job one year later. So yeah. walk us through your career path and walk through some of the stops that you've had along the way. Okay. So as I mentioned, I started out as a personal trainer, just kind of commercial gym stuff, and then uh, settled into to, you know training athletes. I got involved, as I mentioned before, in junior club volleyball, and then that led me down a specific path. I had an opportunity to become a club director, and I actually talked to Mike Boyle specifically about it, mm -hmm. and he advised against it. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't listen. I thought that it was a, a good opportunity and that that's, that's shame on me. But, uh, but I did learn a ton from the experience. I actually won club director of the year for our region oh, in wow. my, in my first and only year doing it. And I despised it. <laughs> and so that, that pushed me away from like the administration and from the club management side back into coaching where I felt way more confident and way more comfortable, you know, engaging with teams and athletes, individuals who were interested in figuring out how to be the best they could be. And so that led me to back into coaching. And then that led me, I'd always had a relationship right now. I'm the, the head of strength and conditioning for Trinity university. And, um, I I'd had a relationship. This is actually going to be year 15, uh, for me with our volleyball program. Wow. And, uh, that's, been going on through the background. I did a lot of private coaching. I got into consulting just after finishing graduate school and started working with the Forstex organization, which now is under uh, the, the Vald Performance umbrella, um, and working in specifically in dual force platform technology. And um, and then that I eventually left that role and ended up full time at Trinity. And I did that for really specific purposes. Um, and that's led me to where I am now. So, yeah, it's it's certainly not the standard collegiate strength and conditioning coach. I always have a hard time when I get, you know, questions and, 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 and you know, uh, people looking for insight into that because I'm like, I could tell you what I did, but it's not <laughs> it's not the, the path that you're going to think that it's going to be, you know. But I, I like I said, I'm grateful for the perspective that I have and the experiences that uh, I enjoyed. Well, and I always try and explain to young coaches, too, like it's it's cliche right you always hear people say oh well be where your feet are and i mm -hmm. get that and sometimes that's hard uh but if you can look at each stop along the way right like not everyone is maybe your favorite stop or there's some that you know you're more or less passionate about but man if you can try and take some positives away from each one mm -hmm. and at the end like you said it gives you a really unique perspective because there's times in my career where i was like oh man that wasn't the funnest time but you learn things about what you do and don't like, and ultimately it gives you a perspective that makes you a better practitioner or a better coach down the line. Absolutely. Like in, and in my environment at Trinity, with us being a division three institution, right, there's a lot of autonomy for the athlete to choose or to not choose to participate in your strength conditioning program. So the authoritarian side of that goes completely out the window because if right. you try to force somebody into some scenario with you that is going to make you happy as the strength conditioning coach and they're not into it. They'll just not come anymore, you know, <laughs> right. and like an outside of these really specific time periods, which are limited in each semester where it's mandatory, there's, there's nothing that you can do. There's no one you can communicate to, to change that. And so that's forced me to really assess the purpose component of what they're there to do and how I'm able to assist them. One of the things that I took from one of my mentors, Dr. Jeremy Shepard was, you know, the, why are you here question, you know, like engaging them instead of saying, Hey, how are you feeling? It's, it's, why are you here? You know, it's like, what's your purpose? And then that's led me to, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. So uh, two of the stories that I'll connect athletes with often are the first one comes from the, I think it's the forward to man's search for meaning from Victor Frankel. And it's a story about, um, uh, 
a, a, a Jewish citizen during Nazi Germany, who in the hopes that the, the, the Germans, the Nazis would find that he's an individual we're saving. He collects all of his degrees and his certificates, and he gets letters from these prominent Nazis to suggest that this is a, this is a Jewish citizen we're saving, right? And so he brings it to the Nazis, and the Nazis look at um, look at it and ask him, "Well, this, is this everything you have?" And he goes, "Well, yeah, it is." And they go, "Good. Now you have nothing." And they took everything away from him, right? Oh wow. Yeah. So it's and then. To, to add a, a, a more lighthearted element to it, because yeah. these, co- these are college kids, yeah. I'll follow I'll follow it up with Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and one of the greatest like opening scenes in cinematic history with Alec Baldwin, which is when he comes in as this hotshot sales guy to motivate this underperforming sales crew. And uh, he starts off, what does he say? He says, he says, we're having a sales contest this month. First prize is a Cadillac Eldorado. Second prize is a set of steak knives. The third prize is you're fired. Hit the bricks. <laughs> so it's like, so I always tell them, I'm like, that's how sports feels, right? It's like you either win big or you're out on the street. Like yeah. that's pretty much the way, especially if you have the competition orientation only. But if instead you become aware of the relationships, right? And the work that you've put into things and the detail, the level of detail that helps you to become more successful. Now you've got something that you can really use to help put together a pathway for other areas of your life. Right. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So one thing that I'd really like to focus on today, and sometimes we do broad, but I think I want to go a little bit deeper dive with you because you've spent so much time learning about developing the vertical jump. I know you're passionate about it. So I'd like to talk a lot about that today. So for starters, Let's say somebody is listening in, they have no clue the different phases of a vertical jump or how to break it down or the lingo around it. Could you just talk about the specific phases or elements that constitute a vertical jump? Absolutely. Uh, so really, I'm going to I'm gonna not start from a technical lens. I'll start from from just kind of coaches lens, which I feel like is, is what I stress in. Mm-hmm. But I, I say initially, just say three phases. The loading phase of the centric or specifically the breaking phase. Um, and there's reasons why you can use each of those terms, right? And you, you wouldn't be wrong, right? Uh, there's the concentric or the propulsive phase, which is that standard kind of push off phase. Um, technically there's flight time and the landing. I would kind of consider those to be really well related. Uh, but if we're talking about the ground reaction forces and what you're actively in control of, it would move into the landing phase. Um, the braking phase, and the reason it's called braking and not eccentric, is because there's more than just eccentric actions happening in the initial stages of a vertical jump, right? Like right. you're actually concentrically oriented from your upper body, in my opinion, and from your trunk as an active means of pulling yourself down, ideally faster than gravity would allow you to. Right. And that that can create more of an active uh, contractile element to the same task. Right. And right. it basically prevents you from just riding the brakes all the way down, which is not a way to be on the gas pedal when you're trying to create that plyometric effect. Right. When you see that, you're going to see way more conservative uh, force time curves. The profile it's going to look it's going to bias towards what we would consider more consistent with squat jump performance. Um, the propulsive phase, the takeoff phase is kind of, is pretty much what I feel like people overemphasize, or at least they, they just undercook the eccentric and braking side of the equation, um, is the, is the push off phase is the one where you actually gain height. So if you watch a lot of athletes, um, depending on how they're coached, you'll see them, like I said before, they'll drop in very conservatively and then they just push off as hard as and as fast as they can. And that's that's not a bad means. It just depends on what strength is hardwired into your system. Uh, but that's what will largely determine your flight time, your jump height. Right. And then the landing phase is actually not, again, not an insignificant factor. It's one of the bigger areas of adaptive potential 
uh, for a long-term resiliency and performance effects, right? Like you're going to see bigger uh, forces on the landing than you'll generally see in the landing phase. You can coach people out of that where they can, I'll use the term absorb force, even though that's not, that's not people are, are debating that currently. Yes. Yes. I think from a coaching language standpoint, that uh, it's always resonated with me. So I would say, yes, that you are absorbing force, even though technically speaking, right? Uh, maybe not the case, but you can teach yourself to not impact so drastically that it's, it's, it's harder on your system, right? Yes. Like, which I, I've always grouped landings into what we call an impact landing, which is, you know, when an athlete just hits the ground yeah. compared to a decelerative landing where they're actually able to engage an active slowing down element to their jump performance. And I always say jumping sport athletes don't land, they fall. And if the ground wasn't <laughs> there, they just keep on falling. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. they're just, they're just falling. Right. Like, yeah. and the reason for that is because the, the orientation is what's happening in the air. That's where the game is. And then they just put whatever attention is left over to that final phase, right? And mm -hmm. that can be disastrous in specific populations. So we want to yes. be aware of that and have strategies to address it. I love it. Well, yeah. and one thing that I know you've talked about numerous times, uh, either via Instagram or articles and things, is that, like you said, we're so focused on like that concentric element, right, in the actual jumping piece. So it's been fun. Uh, over the last couple of years to see more and more people talking about the eccentric, talking about that breaking phase, especially as it pertains to keeping athletes healthy. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's I, I always put things into two buckets, right? We have like, we could call it hygiene or we can call it, res I've been calling it, <laughs> athletes don't really respond well to the hygiene one, but it's uh, <laughs> we could call it like resiliency, resilience effects. There's the resilience bucket and then there's the performance enhancement bucket, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that there's certain thresholds with strength and mobility that will enhance resilience, right? Meaning just like some basic injury prevention, not saying someone's bulletproof, but just saying like, there's not going to be nonsense that's going to stop you, right? right? Right, right. But then we have the the hardwiring that has to occur that can truly lead to performance enhancement. And that a lot of time is that it's that same uh, training focus, but just sharpened to a razor's edge, right? Like it's yeah. just, and that's what you're really talking about in the long term. Uh, and that's something that, yeah, from a vertical jump perspective, my early insights into that process helped every subsequent process go further. Right. And the big thing that I took early was the, uh, what we call the attack the floor strategy is like the, the learning to be aggressive in that downward phase. Right. And it's just yeah. basic physics is that if an athlete's takeoff phase, uh, or if their loading phase is slower than action reaction, their takeoff phase will be slower. If they can take that loading phase faster, that's going to eventually end up with a faster takeoff performance. Now, in the early stages, there's actually really specific stuff we can look at that, um, for instance, like the amortization phase, right? Which yep. is, is uh, that's something that gets a little bit lost. Like when you're looking at force time curves, it dissolves across like the force velocity and the displacement relationships. Like you'd be like, oh, where's the amortization phase? And it's like, well, um, it's not necessarily how it happens. We would we would simply define it as like the force at zero velocity point is probably the 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 closest surrogate for that. But like I said, it's it's you you, you can't just say like this is what was happening there. But what we see in the early stages is that their early impulse in that propulsive phase, which is like their their push off forces, right, uh, and the time window that it occurs within that early phase is negatively affected, right? Yeah. They'll make it up in the later phase because they still have the potential to overcome right. those forces. But in the early phase, you see this little lag that pops in. And that's, I would say, like I said, that's a, that's something that speaks specifically to that compromised bottom jump position. Right. And it's also one of our hugest areas for opportunity because that is as close to uh, a specific example of delayed transmutation as I've ever seen mm -hmm. uh, in, in strength and power development where, you know, like we all know how periodization was supposed to work where you rest and then just like your performance goes to the roof. And <laughs> okay. most of us who've tried that know that that's not, doesn't work that way at all. Your nervous system falls apart and it's ready for a nap, not for, right. you know, peak rep maxes. Right. Uh, so, but with that specifically, like I've seen it time and again, where it's like, yeah, we depressed those forces in that, that, uh, that low joint angle position. 
And then we offset that in the later takeoff phase and then eventually we get that rebound effect and now they're powerful in that bottom position because it's well trained with uh higher eccentric power and then um and then that leads to better better propulsive power yeah or velocity yeah yeah i love it man okay now let's talk about assessing the vertical jump because you've worked for force decks obviously you're very familiar with force plates it would be great if everybody had a pair but we also know that's not yep. always the case, right? So what I would love to hear is how you go about assessing the vertical jump, maybe with and without a force plate, and maybe some of the metrics that you're looking at there. Again, I know it's more than just, oh, man, I touched 40 yep. inches or whatever. So Yep. Yeah, so we basically, like, if we spoke specifically to, to force plates, it would be like the force and time relationship is basically what you're trying to capture. You know, you're trying to find ways. And generally speaking, I would say I almost never am looking at just time windows. But if you have to take force plates away, that's what you're going to be forced into to is that you can actually, you know, through video analysis with, you know, simple softwares like coach's eye, things like that, you can put a timer on it and you can time what someone's down phase is, what that breaking phase actually is, what their full jump performance is. And I, I've, I've bucketed them into what we would call a fast jumper, which is someone who goes through the whole jump motion in a faster effort, right? Mm-hmm start to finish they're going to finish their jump faster but then you have fast finishers which are your classic power athletes who might take longer to go through the whole jump but their final takeoff velocity is always the biggest and therefore they are you know by definition your biggest jumper um, but it just takes them longer to get there and then what we're looking at is we're trying to from those two strategies we're trying to figure out how do you optimize that based on sporting tasks right because if you take let's say a football player's jump performance at the NBA com or at the NFL combine and you apply that to the NBA like they're going to be terrible at rebounding right it yeah. just takes too much time for them to jump up just as high as everybody else then you have the whole anthropometric piece of being like it doesn't matter anyway because you guys are all short you know so it's like <laughs> Uh, so they're disadvantaged in that way. So the, the, the main thing is to be aware that we can bring like a performance bias into things. And there's lots of different ways to define great jump performance, right? So early in my career, I, you know, force plates were not a thing for me. Like I had a contact map pretty early. I had a Tendo unit. And so I would have all sorts of combinations that I would trial and error, just kind of run through. Um, and again, that was one of my early insights in training power was that when we added lighter loads to, uh, jump training and, and, uh, what we would consider, you know, classically power training, our downward phase, a lot of times was like, if not just as fast, it was 95, 90, 95% as fast, but you've added a 45 pound bar or you've added a hundred pounds. And so the athlete's still able to move down really fast. And you're like, well, why is that the case? It's like, well, they took the slack out of the system. That's one thing, right? Like we've seen that benefit, that extra stability, right? And then they're not fighting gravity. They're working with gravity. So if you can right. teach someone what that relaxation should feel like in specific areas. I, I always related it really well uh, to Gray Cook's uh, the the toe touch right and see yeah. watching watching them do the fms magic on the toe touch and be like to me that's a soft flex strategy and then what we're trying to teach with jump performance is a hard flex strategy is okay now instead of looking for mobility from those areas you're looking for stability that's going to add to the spring that you're able to generate and then that's going to give you something to push uh against with your legs right yeah. so then your trunk becomes a really active component to what you're doing in jump performance and by extension the arms and you see the lengths where you know like i i've been i've been critical of because it's you know you'll see these wide ranges like 10 to 20 percent contribution from the arms and vertical jump performance and i'm like well 10 or 20 like i, w I want 20 so how do you do <laughs> how do you do that you know right, like, right. uh and then you'll see people who get no advantage because they just kind of use their arm like you imagine a t-rex would right. they're just kind of hanging there going along for the ride uh, I was like providing athletes with the visual of like me running across the weight room with no arms. It's just, uh, it looks ridiculous, right? I'm yes. like, but that's, that's what your jump performance looks like right now. Right, right. Well, okay. So this actually kind of leads me seamlessly into my next point, because you already talked a little bit about kind of bucketing athletes mm -hmm. and the way that I've always done it. And again, it's probably not nearly as sophisticated as yours. But I always thought of it as you've got like kind of your bouncy pogo yep. sticks 
right? They look like they should be a high jumper, but they actually play basketball or volleyball or whatever sport. You've got your strength or your force dominant, which you kind of alluded to. That's like your running mm-hmm. back, right? Yep. He looks like a bowling ball, but man, if you give him enough time and two feet yeah. to jump off of, he looks great. And then you've yep. got your balance, and those are like the freaks. Uh-huh. Um, and, and in basketball, I talk about, man, if you can finish off your right, off your left, and off two, you're kind mm-hmm. of a savage because not many people can do that. So I'd love to hear how do you bucket your athletes? Is it something similar, or what do you go yep. through? Yeah, I would say it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Like the terminology, like I said, like I, I related it, it, you know, like I, I love CrossFit actually, but I relate it with weightlifting performance and tell people like the fast jumper is like the CrossFit lifter. Like they're going to go through five reps faster than any elite weightlifter on the planet, right? Like yes. they're just like, and not because they can lift more weights than that elite lifter. It's because of the way that they train and that's how yeah. they've adapted, right? Where you have the elite lifter is the fast finisher who they might take longer to get through each rep, but my gosh, if that's not the most explosive performance that you, you know, you ever see on a lifting platform, like it's just always impressive. Like I, I, I competed in weight lifting for eight years and I still can watch videos and it's just, it's just such harmony. You know, I just love it. So, um, I bucket them in a very similar way. Uh, like I said, fast jumper and then fast finisher, and that really covers the elastic piece and then the strength and power orientation piece. Right. And the big thing that we want to, we want to be sensitive to is, uh, variability or a lack of variability in the system and what that will do to the structures that support that performance, right? Where we know that the elastic guys can be more prone to tendon issues, right? Because, you know, I always say like, you know, when they're doing a vertical jump test, you see uh, these really high knee angles, right? You see like minimal flex, right? Uh, And then you have them do like a drop jump or even a depth jump test and you see the same stuff, you know? So it's like, and then you watch them change direction and they're just throwing their feet at the ground, you know? Uh, (laughs) Chris Chase, Chase, you know, uh, uh, from the Memphis Grizzlies, mutual friend, uh, he always told me, he said, yeah, he says, our guys are always just trying not to fall. Like that's a big part of like their movement strategy. And that's what I've taken to referring uh, to as uh, repositioning stability, right? Instead of generating movement velocity, they're just changing where they're getting stability from. It's like a bad box jump performance, right? When somebody lifts their feet, uh, that's what bad deceleration looks like, things like that. And it just becomes really difficult to use one lens to qualify like what makes an elite performance. Like the, the other example that, that I come to is that in, uh, in P3's database, Luca and, uh, uh, and the beard and Harden are, are both considered elite decelerators. Right. Mm. But when I think about it and I think about what I qualify as deceleration, I'm thinking like Kobe and Jordan, you know, like yeah. you're seeing these really specific angle changes and that's not, Harden's game. That's certainly not Luca's game, you know, right. like, so it's like, so like, well, what's really happening and what, what, what my sense of it is without taking like a really hard look at, at their data is that you're reeling a, you're seeing a, a highly specific relationship with deceleration where they've optimized their position relative to their demands. Like and that might be a mouthful to say, forgive me for that, but yeah. in, in essence, they didn't bend that that low, but what they did bend, they did it really fast. Yeah. And based on their structure and their body type, they're really strong at that position, and they're able to really disrupt. Like then they're they're threatening enough that they make their opponents think like, "Wow, they're really going to do something here." And instead, they hit the step back or they hit something else uh, off of that step. And the next thing you know, they have space and they just need that little bit of space and it's game over. Right. Because I would be like the idea that they paired elite deceleration and turn that into elite propulsive power. Like I would debate that with, you know, James Harden and Lucas right. specifically. I'd be like, I don't think so. You know, right. like, and I don't think anyone's made that claim. Otherwise they would say, Oh yeah, they're one of the most explosive athletes, which we, we just, we know inherently it's like, it's, you know, that that's not the case. That's not their game. Right. That is so fascinating, especially when you start to think about it. Cause one of my athletes, Dakota Matthias, he's always sending me like Luca clips. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's just mm-hmm. like, you look at him and you're like, dude, He's not right. fast. Right. He's not. He's like, right. he's not fast. Uh, right. You look at him and in some ways, and I don't mean this negatively because he's an amazing yeah. basketball player. And I love watching him, but he doesn't look like an right. elite athlete. 
It right. doesn't, he doesn't have the physical appearance, like you said, of a Michael Jordan, of a Kobe. But, man, you watch him, and he can put the brakes on. And next yep. thing you know, that guy's just a little bit out of position, and he knows what to do yep. with his body to create a little bit more separation if he needs it. And that's all it yeah. takes. Yeah, and that's one of the things, like some of the early insights with the force platform stuff is one of the early metrics in the research was eccentric deceleration rate of force development, right? Yep. Super noisy metric, really hard to get reliably. Uh, but everybody loved it because it could show like this, like, you know, what was happening in a really specific phase of that braking cycle, right? Um and, and certain organizations really took that and ran with it. And others have, you know, we've been slower to, to accept that. And the reason for that is because that's exactly what you're seeing is that they, they will compromise overall performance by biasing towards a fast uh, eccentric phase that spikes that. And really what happens is when they're that fast jumper, they cut the distance of their movement of their displacement in half at least. Right. right? Yeah. So they're moving half as far. And if they move at the same speed, then that's automatically more quote unquote powerful, or it's a higher rate of force development. Right. right. But, you, but at what, you know, joint angles, right. And is that reflective of, of really the task demands? And that's really the challenge is, is if you do have someone who, who you would define as an elite jumper, uh, what do you do next with them to provide the necessary support? Right. And that's something that, you know, I, I've been really specific about where I work from a technical model perspective in that I'm going to start with what looks to me like great jumping, um, using the whole body and using a lot of congruency, right? Like your trunk, hips, knees, ankles, all of that working together. Um, and then we'll start to bias towards the higher knee angles relative to what their position and what their sport demands are over time. Like that would be the closest thing to how periodization would, would look up is that we're going to align the forces um, and the plyometric training to, to line up with where they they will optimize that based on their sport and based on their, their positional demands. Right. Mm. But there's still that resiliency piece that has to operate in the background. I took this from Derek Evely, where he said the, you know, th that piece, the, which we could call general training, because it's not specific to jump performance. The general training is like antivirus in a software, right? It's not why you buy a computer, but it's there in the background to make sure that things keep on working properly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that, that I've always, you know, like been sensitive to maintaining. And that's the thing I think that in this day and age, again, with social media's emphasis, you'll see people who are, you know, vertical jump experts or dunking experts, even that, right. you know, like that, who are telling people, well, you know, if you got the strength foundation, you really just need to spend a whole lot more time dunking. And I'm like, well, but that's not a basketball strategy. That's a dunking strategy, you know, like, and <laughs> right. it's like, so it's like, I don't know if that's good advice for someone or not. You need more criteria. Right. And that's yeah. the thing is that, yes, certainly spend more time on the specific task, but let's say for instance, that they have a competitive season that they're also preparing for, would that strategy be adapted at all? And most of those coaches I have to believe would say, well, yeah, I'd, you know, I'd feel like I'd have to, you know, address some of the, some of the, the conditioning demands and I'd have this. And I say, yeah, all of a sudden you start moving into that general bucket. And then you've got these other things that you're like, you're aware of may not optimize a single instantaneous performance, but contribute to the overall harmony of how they'll accept their, their season's competition loads. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is a great point too, because you and I both know that emphasizing any one thing too much generally takes away from like global athleticism, right? So For sure. the dunk guy that's just trying to help little Johnny dunk, I mean, that's great. And maybe now he can right. dunk when there's nobody on a court or he doesn't have to dribble or whatever, but it actually detracts from his ability to go out and play the game at a high level because he doesn't have some of these other movement skills that he needs to perform in a game. For sure. For sure. And that's, and that's the thing is, is that, you know, taking nothing away from those guys, like they're, uh, I, I'm grateful, right? Like it's all adding perspective for people. And then a lot of times you'll get someone, I'll add an athlete, send me a clip yesterday of like an, uh, of, of a training exercise from some uh, Instagram expert. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I love the dialogue. I love having the opportunity. And, and the number one thing is that the positive intent associated with this is this is not someone trying to undermine you. This is someone saying, would this help me? Right. right? Exactly. And that's that if I can orient around that, then I'm like, let's talk about it. And I can explain to you exactly like how things fit in. 
because otherwise, gosh, I would, I would hate to be growing up as an athlete in this day and age. Cause I would be overwhelmed yeah. just like they are with the same amount of information, you know, like having the opportunity, like I said, growing up in the time that we did pre-internet even, <laughs> uh, was like, gosh, you know, I'm grateful for the filter that I was able to develop. That's probably as important as the knowledge base around what we're, we're trying to implement. Yeah. I love it, man. Okay. So let's take our buckets right? You've got your balanced, your, your bouncy elastic creatures, and you got your force dominant creatures. The balanced ones are easy, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like those people, especially if they can already jump pretty high, it's like, don't screw them up and just keep things rolling. Like you can do, I feel like almost anything, as long as it's not just ridiculous and they get better. But let's talk about your extremes on uh, either end, right? Like Mm -hmm. your pogo sticks, uh, like the super elastic creatures, and then your force dominant creatures. What is your philosophy or what do you do if you're bucketing them out and you're like, I want to give them just a little bit more juice or I want to shift them or profile them a little bit more towards the middle? What kind of stuff are you doing with each of those respective groups? Yeah, uh, I think it may need a little bit more context if we're talking to bouncy individuals only because like, let's say, for instance, track and field, right? When you have yeah. them biased towards like these highly specific angles, then it's like, yeah, I, I could say that, you know, we would we would attack some general loads and we would have more of like a, a, a periodization sequence at play than maybe their training currently provides, right? We'd ask them to bend in ways that we can respect their structure and build, right? Like. Yeah you know, squat wedges, things like that, uh, that will enable them to hit some of those positions while reducing the threat on their system, right? But then at the same time, stay with that tried and true strategy that you see if you look at elite performers in those same activities, which will bias towards where their strengths lie, right? And I think that's, you can't get that far away from that, but certainly you can add, again, that that resiliency piece I think is super critical, especially on the elastic types, right? The other athletes, and that was, it brings me to an example that we had on the the Force Text blog pretty early. I think it was our first blog and the first one that i contributed was our early example was like this elite uh football player um soccer from the premier league and we were comparing his jump performance to a gold medalist from the olympics in weightlifting right and you know the point of it was like well look at these eccentric rates and eccentric powers and everything but if you looked at the propulsive characteristics the the weightlifter was obviously the superior jumper and by our our historical definition clearly the elite jumper but we were using it to to basically say like well who 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 is it well what do they have to do right who do they have to be that's what really defines it but but I became more critical of that mentality because number one, I saw a lot of the effects of that where in the international football community where strength and power training and performance training as a whole has lagged a little bit, not so much recently, but uh, early on, then we see that some of them just, they just don't train. They don't have the time to train. And so they don't, they're, they're not truly changing that formula. So it's, it's not a fair thing to assess in that way. And the way that I took to look at it is I said, okay, I said, we could say that, you know, that premier league athlete is in fact, an elite athlete. I don't think that that's debatable. Uh, but if we were to apply a plyometric intervention to those two athletes, and you take that athlete who's more force dominant and you all of a sudden throw some stretch shortening cycle at him, what's going to happen in his jump performance? He's going to be faster in those eccentric rates. So his adaptive potential is actually way higher, right? Yeah. Where for the Premier League athlete, he's going to have to relearn position and he's going to have to, you know, uh, uh, associate threat to his, his lower body muscle architecture differently than the way that he might play his game, right? If yeah. he's going to be able to show, but, and, and the reason for that is because all of the adaptations are occurring in such a specific window, right? That it negates the effects of like any sort of general um, uh, stimulus that you may provide. And another example uh, that that I have that I can I can link to that is um, there's a famous uh, uh, international volleyball player who who uh, hurt her ankle and had to have surgery, and she was an elite jumper, like one of the best ever. But coming out of that, she wasn't able to train adequately in a way that would get her back to that top performance or really her rehabilitation and her pathway back was, was extended. It was like way, way longer than anyone thought. And, and to my knowledge, like what I really see at play is the fact like, well, 
she had that one bucket that she had filled, which is like, you know, it's the dunking bucket or it's the just jump a lot bucket. But the fact that she hadn't filled those other buckets that were so available and that can support that performance meant that, okay, now that's not an option for you in your early rehab stage. You can't jump your way back into physical condition. So what do we do now? It's like, well, we have to learn all of these other techniques and methods for how to put this thing together again. And that's, of course, you're starting at absolute ground zero. Um, It's going to be a lot more work that way. So it's kind of like, I guess, diversifying, you know, your financial investments, you know, things like that. I think that that's always an apt analogy because, um, yeah, you're either going to be living well or living poorly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is really seamless because young coaches nowadays are exposed to so many different strategies, right? So many tools. And again, you and I came up in a certain day and age where <laughs> we did not have access to as many resources, as much information. But if you go on Instagram right now, you can hear people talking about exaggerated eccentrics, ISOs of all shapes and sizes, jump-specific activities. How do you help young coaches understand that there's a time and a place for everything, but they also need to know when that time and place is? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say... The big thing is getting them to understand, you know, like one one of the ways that we express it in the collegiate environment is 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 suggesting to them that you could have four years of legitimate college, you know, varsity sport experience, or you could have one year that you repeat four times, right? Yes. Uh, and so getting them to understand that four years is a tremendous opportunity, right? But how we have to do is we have to look at what their foundations are, right? Like we can look at what they have available, and we could use a software hardware. Um, kind of assessment in, ter- in terms of like what their learning to date has been, right? The hardware piece is is obviously like performance testing is like, okay, how does your jump stack up, you know, historically to great jumpers on our campus, right? And and hopefully beyond that. Um, same thing with sprint performance, same thing with strength performance. And then having some numbers to look at and say, okay, now how do we get there, right? And then you start reverse engineering a training plan to address that, right? Um the thing about giving them perspective on how to not chase, I, like, I honestly have to tell you that I, I don't, I don't know that I have much expertise in that matter because I feel like every day I walk up on our fitness center and you find an athlete <laughs> doing something that's ill-advised right. <laughs> that you're like, I know we had this conversation, but yeah, I would just say that like just teaching them to be patient and understand that, you know, for everybody, the best program that exists is the one that you're not doing. So it's like, so you're, what you, what you really have to do is it comes back to what we talked about in the very beginnings of our conversation is, is, is having an appreciation for where you are as an athlete, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, right? Like what you've paid attention to. And if you have that in place and you can make the big time, like where you are and focus on the details around that, then you're going to find yourself in a way better position you know, in the next three to six months, right? And so on and so forth through your career. And part of that will be increasing their understanding of some of these phase specific adaptations that we're very aware of, right? Like the, the, the triphasic stuff from Cal Dietz was like, you know, transformative for the field because it got people to think beyond the concentric phase, right? Even though some of the stuff I think is not really uh, held up very well. Um, But it's certainly like a hell of a good place to start and a lot better than most of us were doing, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, So this, it's not bad strategy. And then uh, I think you see some of those models continue to transform because even, even if you had critiques of the triphasic program, where that is now is not where it was right. When, you know, Cal and, uh, and Ben wrote, wrote the book on it a long time ago. Each of them has adapted, changed, and grown. And that's what you should take from people like that is that um, they're going to continue to evolve through their career, in their coaching, right, in their performance. And and that's really what you want to be sensitive to is that you're just seeing one instantaneous moment in time. And um, But if you lose, you know, kind of the forest for the trees with respect to that, then then you're not aware that you know, you do have some direction, you have somewhere you're trying to go and you have to be a little bit patient in in, uh, hoping to achieve that. Yeah. Okay. One more and then we'll start to wrap up. It's kind of in that same vein, but 
how do we help people? And it could be other coaches that have been indoctrinated, or it could be athletes that have been exposed to this idea that vertical jump performance, or really athletic development for that matter, they're so focused on just force development and just get strong. Their solution to everything is get strong. How do you help them understand there's more to either vertical jump or just athletic development than just getting strong? Yeah. So I've got some really specific examples for that because that's the great thing about having data. So we had, for instance, we have, uh, I won't say which men's team, but on one of our specific men's team, like they were famous for hex bar deadlift training strategy, right? Like Mm -hmm. everything begins and ends with the hex bar deadlift. And we had, you know, lots of guys at two and a half, three times beyond that on, uh, in their body weight in on the hex bar deadlift but not a single one could triple their body weight in their vertical jump performance on the force plates. Not a single one out of like a roster of more than 50, right? And we had a volleyball player who also happened by coincidence, maybe, uh, to be dating one of the baseball players who did exactly that and out jumped our entire uh, baseball. Oh, I sorry, I kind of gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's our all right. Baseball roster. Excuse me for that, yeah. baseball. But uh, uh, she was dating one of the players and managed to out jump them all. And then when when I looked at it and you break it down, because that's like in my nature and you're thinking like, well, what's different about that performance? And then I looked at the other big jumps. We had a, a an athlete who was around a 10-5 sprinter, uh, maybe just shy of that, maybe a 10-5, 9, 10, 6. Uh, it's kind of disingenuous to call it 10-5. But yeah. um, anyway, him and we had one of our high jumpers who jumped, they pretty much jumped the same height as her. I gave her the edge. Um in our analysis, but they pretty much all jumped the same height. And in my head, I was thinking like, well, these guys like very explosive, right? Like I've seen, you know, their jump performance, like what is it that didn't come through in that? And the big thing from my perspective was that eccentric velocity, the load that Mm -hmm. they applied, right? Her eccentric velocity on that vertical jump performance was negative two meters per second, right? Um, one of them was around one and a quarter meters per second. And one of them was around one meter per second, which is 50% as fast, right? Like it's like, it's, it's, and I'm like, that's a good bench press velocity. (laughs) So you're vertical jumping and you're bench pressing, right? It's like if the Mars moving at one meter per second, like on bench press, you're killing it. But on jump performance, it's not, it's not so good. And that's in the downward phase, you know? So it's, uh, so that allowed her to access her strength in the eccentric phase right? In a very narrow time window, that's the other piece of it, right? Is the force time relationship is that uh, most of those guys had learned the strength strategy, which is to bend slower and then just try to push off as hard as you can. Um, And it's just, that's not how our muscle physiology, that's not how mechanics actually work for us, right? So it put limits on the velocities that they were going to be able to achieve based on how much strength was hardwired into their system. There's a point where you get some pushback on that. And you can actually, when you see an athlete who's really strong, like they will sky no matter what. Uh, But again, whether that aligns with the sport and positional demands and and with what their training needs are at any given time point, uh, that that remains to be seen. The, The most accurate way I've heard that if I had to wrap that up is from Eric Renahan, um, who's with the Miami Hurricanes right now, but was previously with the St. Louis Blues and some private uh, coaching consulting between that. Um, he referred to it as a force time asymmetry because we're aware of limb asymmetries, right? Like left and right side. Right. But to have a force asymmetry, right, means that you're like you're just selling all out for the strength, right? right. And the time piece is like, well, you moved really fast, but were you Didn't go were anywhere. you yeah, were you impactful with that movement speed? And so you're really trying to put those things together and have that awareness of both. Mm, I love that, man. Now, here's what would be really cool. And I don't know if you had time to do this, but you take those people and then actually say, hey, look, this is what I could do with you right? if I gave you this specific training intervention, right? Because like you said, right. that's a low-hanging fruit. Somebody's moving downward at one meter per second. Yep. If you could just have a little bit of time and, you know, like, that's pie in the sky. Sometimes they've got other demands or other things you have to train for. But man, it'd be really cool if you could take them and take them through some training interventions and get some changes. That would be pretty fun. I'm so glad you brought that up. 
because yeah. that's pretty much exactly what happened. I had, oh, nice. uh, I had, I had boyfriends a little bit out of shape about, uh, about, his <laughs> about their girlfriends beating him. <laughs> yeah. If you could imagine that, right. Yeah. Like, but he had, he had the humility. He came to me and he said, Hey, you know, what could I do? And so we, we put him through some training and sure enough, you know, within, within about a month, right. He had lots of strength available within about a month. He out jumps her and the smirk that he gave me, I mean, it was memeable. <laughs> it was like, it was, <laughs> I actually did send, I forget who the character is, but there's a Game of Thrones character and there's a famous meme where he does this kind of like nod, like yeah. kind of uh, smirk <laughs> moment. And uh, yeah, he, he he gave me one of those when he saw his jump performance results. Like, ah, oh, nice. look at me now. Who's the boss? <laughs> That's right. That's Vaughn, man. All right, my guy, big question time. If yep. you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Daniel Martinez one piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah, this one... Uh, I'm aware you ask this question often, um, but are you aware of what the uh, the most common phrase in the Bible is? I'm not. It's do not be afraid, right? Okay. Or have no fear. Some some reference right. to to that in in you know different words at times, but do not be afraid, right? Like, and that's something that's you know you could start out and it can kind of be big and kind of you know hard to apply. But I, I have to think that there's times, like I said, in my my times in failing as a student athlete, I think that there was a fear around you know like what we would call like fixed versus growth mindset. Um, there's a fear around all of the things that I didn't understand about myself and about the world that I lived in, right? And that led me to limit certain opportunities and to again over identify as an athlete when. And I'm aware now that I'm way more complex than than just being an athlete, right? I'm yes. kind of a, a big nerd, actually. So it's like, so it was a disservice to that. And it took me time to mature through that. Um, and a lot of growth in my 20s that really allowed me to 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 turn into the person that I am today. And that's, that's my defense over that for all of the stupid things that I've done is that I was just learning, you know, but like part of that is, is embracing that don't be afraid of approach. One of the, one of the first um, words that was used for warrior comes from the Tibetan language. It's the word Pawo and Pawo means uh, it's it's a bravery and it's a fearlessness, but the fearlessness in Pawo is it refers to um, not being afraid of who you are, right? Not not being afraid of something else, but not being afraid of who you are and what you bring to the table, right? Which I find oh, I like that. fascinating, right? Like to yeah. think like, okay, like num- it starts here, right? Mm-hmm. Like it starts with me. I like that. I like that. All right, my guy, last but not least, lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. This one should be pretty straightforward. Number one, biggest, even though we've talked about not just focusing on the concentric, what's the biggest vertical jump you've ever seen? Because you're in volleyball. You have to have seen a couple just monsters. Yeah, you know, and and but but the reality is, it's like we said, when we we talk, most of what I'm linking our vertical jump testing to is is, um, the, uh, the force plate testing right and that puts because of the way that we do it when you put somebody's hands on their hips it limits some of the expression of how that's performed but i did see a 70 centimeter vertical jump from a female athlete that was you know exceptional i was up at talking to uh Vern gambetta early in the force plates deal uh he was getting ready to do his big gain event and i was up there and one of the coaches that was assisting him and i think was a assistant coach at rice at the time was a two-time olympian and and she volunteered to be our our jumper and you know she she did she used a very upright torso and angles and i remember watching it but gosh she was lightning so that was one of those things like yeah i'm not messing with that like i have my <laughs> training philosophies but i'm like what did you do to do that and we're going to do more of that you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty is pretty impressive and on the force plates right 70 centimeters you do the math 2.54 divide by 2.54 it doesn't sound like a lot but when you compare it to like what's happening on contact mats and things like that it's apples and oranges so yeah. a 70 is a 70 is big yeah that's massive all right yeah. i'm curious what brought you back to coaching after spending your time with force decks yeah, that's a, it's a really great question, right? Like the Forstex thing was huge at the time. I was the U.S. consultant for Forstex, so I was responsible. Like it's actually, it sounds huge, right? Yeah. Like it's like I was responsible for the uh, North American continent, basically. Uh, and you know, there were a lot of huge opportunities that. I think came out of that. I had tremendous experiences across a couple of different organizations, truly transformative stuff, right? Like that affected my confidence um, and and my communication skills. 
but I had young kids, right? And yeah. I had this like this narrow window where I felt like my presence could actually be truly impactful in their lives. And that's a really difficult thing to think like, Oh, I'm, I'm crushing the world, but it's gotta be outside of my zip code. You know, like right. it's like, uh, and so that, that's, that's the primary thing, right? Like secondarily, there's some long-term stuff specific to like, to, to their college education and what my role at Trinity will allow me to, to support them with. And so that's, that's, that's playing the long game. And that's certainly yeah. something that's in my nature. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'd say that that's, that's honestly probably the, the, the main thing. And I had some experiences as well where, um, just the consistency of being the best coach, being the best father, being the best person that I know how to be, I wanted to represent that consistency in their lives because I, I didn't have that as a guide for myself. So one of my early goals was like, I want to be my kid's hero, right? Like, and and that's, and and that's, that's something that I really work to, to embody. Right. Uh, But again, you can't do that if, if, if you're not, yeah, if you're not there. Yeah. I respect dude. Respect. I appreciate that. And it's funny because this next question will actually kind of go right into that. And I'd like to ask parents this, but sure. How has being a parent influenced your coaching? Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been an opportunity to figure out how full of crap I am or not, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, because with, you know, with the kids, with the relationship in the backdrop, right? Like when my, my kids both train now, right? Like I mentioned to you before we got on the recording that, uh, they do jujitsu, but they also, I've had them doing some very modest, like introduction to strength training, mobility. We do med ball throws and sprints, all the yeah. stuff that, you know, basically like a, 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 a PE curriculum, right? They go through that. And at times, times, right? I've got to play. I'm still playing the long game with their development. So I can't sell out for any one training session. I've got to keep in mind the big picture. So like I said before, like there's a lot of storytelling that goes into it. There's a lot of perspective I'm trying to provide, right? Like there was a point in this past summer where I, I, you know, I stopped them because they were goofing off quite a bit, which is often fine. But in this case, I was like, look, guys, I said, like, we're a little bit off track here. I said, you guys have to understand the opportunity that's in front of you is, is to me, like the gym is a sacred space, right? Like, it's like, it's a place that can transform people on the level of like, you know, Buddhist monasteries hidden far away in the mountains and things like of that nature of like these, like, you know, fantastic dojos where these martial arts masters are, are, are uh, training people and turning them into, into deadly weapons, you know, things like that, you know, just laying it on pretty thick. Right. But it's like, but I'm telling them, I'm like, this is like, this is legitimately something that like, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not good at a lot of things. I can't, you know, do your plumbing and I can't, you know, <laughs> fix my car, you know, anything right. like that. I'm like, but I'm good at this, you know, and I, I, I can be helpful to you. And, and I truly believe in, in the confidence aspect of it yes. and in what being strong, especially with my daughter and seeing, you know, college student athletes every single day who don't believe they can do a good push up or don't believe they'll ever be able to do chin ups and things like that. And so that's, you know, for the student athletes that I, uh, I coach and for my daughter and anyone else who I connect with, that's like, I want them to be aware that there's an opportunity for them if they are willing to hunt for it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Okay. Number four, last but not least, what's next for Daniel Martinez, man? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think right now, honestly, like I'm the most centered and balanced. I feel like I've ever been, I feel like the demands on my time and on my attention are the most that they've ever been as well. So I feel fortunate to have grown into that, Yeah, but you know, I've had a couple of opportunities. I've gone through a few recruitment processes with, with other organizations that were interested in, in having me on and, and, and that that's great. And I'm always open to those things, but I'm truly happy where I am and with my experience. And a lot of people, I think, because I'm at a small school, just assume that, you know, like I'm, I'm just waiting for the chance to go to <laughs> a big, big school. Thing, and that's right. Yeah. Right. And that's just not the case at all is that like uh, on a day to day basis, I'm happy to make the impact in the lives of the student athletes under my care. And that's what I'm focused on right now as a big bonus. Right. Being at a small school, I tend to have more opportunity to be present with my kids and their events and activities. And that is something for a collegiate strength coach that is invaluable. Yeah, I love it, man. Well, Daniel. 
It only took us three years, but man, I'm glad we made it happen. Thanks so much for coming on. Where can my listeners find out more about you? Yeah, I'm mostly active on uh, Twitter at Entheos Athletic, um, and then on uh, Instagram as Daniel Martinez MSCSCS. Uh, you can also find my inter- information on the TrinityTigers.com website, uh, um, or I'm also on LinkedIn. Those main platforms. I'm mostly contributing on Instagram for, you know, it's it's like digital scrapbooking, right? So it's yeah. uh, I'm, I'm I'm into that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where on Twitter, I'm more you know sharing, retweeting research and interesting dialogue that's brought on by people who are willing to engage what that platform offers, which I struggle with. Uh, yeah. But you know, <laughs> I'm 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 happy to to read. I love it, man. Well, Daniel, thanks again for coming on, man. This was really great. Yeah, thank you for having me. Again, I'm always grateful for the opportunity. I hope I provided some value. Absolutely. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's episode with Daniel Martinez. Really hope you enjoyed it. I had a ton of fun talking with him, took a ton of notes. But like I said up top, it's kind of like a a user's guide to vertical jump training. We covered assessments. We covered profiling. We talked about training interventions. So While it may not be the be-all, end-all, it's really hard to do that in a one-hour episode. If nothing else, I hope it stimulates some good thought. And if you found some areas where you're maybe a little bit weaker, again, whether it's assessments or profiling or training interventions, hopefully it clues you in on where you need to be spending your time to continue to grow and evolve and level up your own skill sets. So if you enjoyed the episode, please do me one small favor. Please share this with somebody who you might feel ben- would benefit from the information that we share today. Because look, whether it's a fellow athlete, whether it's another coach, whether it's a sport coach in basketball or volleyball that probably wants to get their athletes jumping higher, if you know somebody that would benefit from hearing our message and the information that we shared, if you could share that, I would greatly appreciate it. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.